Hello, welcome. It's another exciting day. We're going to move up a rung on our ladder and we're going to start talking about morphology. So we are done with phonology. We're done with the structure of sounds. We're moving up to the structure of words. And this is particularly exciting because morphology is going to be where we're starting to make contact between sound and meaning. Remember, we can think of language as a set of signs, pairings of sound and meaning, and morphology is where that really starts to happen. So morphology is the study of the structure of words. In phonology, we saw that sounds contrast with each other in order to distinguish words from each other. But when we get to morphology, we're going to have to ask in a more detailed way how it is exactly that sounds can convey meaning in language. What are the smallest units of language that can convey meaning in this way? Do these units have structure? How do these units combine with one another? We're going to see that the smallest unit of language that conveys an identifiable meaning is something called a morpheme. So in phonology, we were talking a lot about phonemes, which are units of sound. In morphology, we're going to be talking a lot about morphemes, which are sort of units of sound meaning combination, as we'll see. Morphemes then combine together to form these things that we call words. So we'll call this idea of the sign. We talked about this in the second lecture of the class. A sign is a combination of a form and a meaning. So you can think about a sign as a sort of pairing. It's a pair that has a form on one side and a meaning on the other side. The example we used was we said the form cat is associated in English with the meaning of this furry creature, a pairing of form and meaning. Now that we've talked about phonology, we can refine this notion of form. So we can, in fact, talk about a linguistic sign, which is a special kind of sign, which combines a phonological form with some meaning. A phonological form is just a sequence of phonemes. So a linguistic sign is going to combine a form like the phonemes k, e, and then t, with a meaning like this furry creature here. And remember, the way in which the form and meaning are linked in most, the vast majority of linguistic signs, is symbolic. These are symbols, which means that the association between this particular phon phonological form and this particular meaning is a matter of arbitrary convention. It's just an arbitrary convention of the English-speaking community that this particular form is associated with this particular meaning, this particular creature. So let's look for patterns now in this pairing of forms with meanings. We have the word cat, which looks like this creature. We also, in English, have this word cats with an S added at the end, an S sound. And the meaning of that is, well, it's the same creature, but now there's a lot of them. It's plural. So we have the word cat, which refers to one creature like this. We have the word cats, a related form, which refers to a group of such creatures. That's interesting. It looks like there might be some kind of systematic structure, some kind of linkage between the structure of the form and the structure of the meaning. There's other signs that are like this in English. So we have a word like cat-like, and that is an adjective referring to things which resemble cats. We also have an adjective catty, and that refers to um, situations or people that uh, have certain aspects of cats, usually a negative personality aspects related to cats. We see a bunch of forms that are phonologically related to each other. They all have this element cat, and they're associated with meanings, which also have some element in common. They all have to do with these feline creatures. The forms all include the sequence of phonemes cat, and the meanings all involve the feline creatures. So now we're ready to talk about this idea of morphemes. In these signs, in those examples, the phoneme sequence cat 
makes a regular contribution to meaning. That means it's a unit that makes the same contribution to meaning as part of several different signs. So across those different signs, we had that same element, that same sequence of phonemes cat, and it was making the same contribution to the meaning in all of those different signs. A morpheme is the smallest unit, the smallest linguistic unit that conveys a regular meaning. So the words cat, cats, cat-like, catty, they all contain the morpheme cat. We're going to go through now a few examples digging into this definition of morpheme. So what do I mean by conveys a regular meaning? Let's look at our examples of signs again. Here are our signs, four different signs. We can segment them based on their morphemes. So they all contain the morpheme cat plus some other morpheme. So the plural morpheme s or the ending like or the ending e. The point is that the morpheme cat appears regularly in these different signs, and in each of those signs it makes the same contribution to meaning, so it always contributes the feline mammal part of that meaning. The same contribution to meaning across different signs is what we mean by regularity, it conveys a regular meaning. What do we mean by the smallest linguistic unit? Well, we mean it's the smallest sequence of phonemes that can be identified as conveying that regular meaning. So let's take the phoneme sequence cat, which is associated with this meaning of this creature, and let's see if there are any smaller units inside of this. Let's see if we can analyze this, breaking it apart into smaller morphemes. Well, we can try to split it up. We can look at a little part of it and look at the part that's just ka, just splitting off the T, ignoring that for a second. Let's just look at the a part. Does that mean anything? Ka. Does ka make any relevant contribution to the meaning of this form? Does ka mean anything regularly in any other words? No. It's just a meaningless sequence of sounds. So it doesn't really have a meaning. What if we just pull off the t at the end? We have cat. So we're thinking about cat as split into ka and t, and we're asking, does the t convey any regular meaning? No, it doesn't mean anything. T, it that doesn't mean anything regularly in English. There's nothing really in common among all the words that end in a t sound in English. So again, no regular meaning in these smaller pieces. Cat is the smallest unit that does have the regular meaning. If you try to look into the parts of cat itself, you see that each of those parts doesn't have any meaning. So when you add to a morpheme, you're going to get meanings that are still related to the underlying morpheme. That's the regularity part. When you take away from a morpheme, when you take phonemes away from it, you suddenly end up in a situation where there's no relevant identifiable meaning. Another way of saying this is that a morpheme is a form meaning pairing that cannot be analyzed into parts. It's atomic in the sense that it can't be broken into parts. So like when we have a word cats, in fact, we can break it into parts. It has cat, which regularly contributes the meaning of a feline creature, and it has s at the end, which regularly contributes the meaning of plural in English. Cat means it has to do with cats. S means there's more than one of them, or zero of them. Cats, the word, consists of two morphemes. Now let's just work, look at the word cat. Can we break it up into a morpheme ka and another morpheme t? No, because ka doesn't mean anything regularly. T does not mean anything regularly. So cat is an indivisible unit. It's a morpheme nor can we split it into k and then at. So k is a meaningless phoneme. At, well, it, it's the word at, but that's not a relevant part of the meaning cat as it's formed here. Here's another example. We have the morpheme cat, which refers to the feline creature. We have the word catalog, which refers to these items, which can contain all kinds of useful information and deals listed out. So does the word catalog contain the morpheme cat? Do you think the, the word catalog contains the morpheme cat? No, 
because catalog cannot be analyzed into relevant meaningful parts. So you could segment it into cat and then a log, but a catalog has nothing to do with a cat, right? So the morpheme cat is not making a regular contribution to the meaning of catalog. Catalog is a separate morpheme that just happens to contain the phoneme sequence cat inside of it, but it doesn't contain the morpheme cat. So let's do some examples of identifying morphemes. What are the morphemes in the English word singing that has phonemes singing, s, ing, ing? Would this be a valid segmentation into morphemes? I've split it into s and then ng. Let's see. Can we find any regular contributions to meaning that are made by these parts? S doesn't really correspond to anything. That's not a piece of meaning that you see regularly in other signs. Ning, no regular contribution to meaning. How about this? Let's split it into singe and then ng. What does singe mean? Nothing. What does ng mean in English? Nothing. All right. How about this? Sing and then ing. Well, yes, yeah, sing, that shows up in a lot of other words, like sing and sings and singer. It means produce music here and in other words, so it's making a relevant and regular contribution to meaning. Ing also is something that shows up in a lot of different words. It means ongoing event here and in other words, like walking, jumping, etc. So now for sing and ing, could we split those further into further morphemes? No. As we saw, these are two indivisible units of the form meaning association to morphemes. Another example. Let's look at the English word untouchable, given here in phonemes, untouchable. So would we split this into unt and uchable? Would, if we go through a bunch of English words, will we find that unt is something that makes a regular identifiable contribution to meaning? No. What about uchable? No. So no regular meaning is associated with these pieces. How about this? Un and then touchable. Hmm, this seems more promising, right? We see un as a prefix on a lot of different words. You can, in words like unbelievable and uncool. Here and in other words, this prefix un is making a regular contribution to the meaning. And how about the other part, touchable? Does this make a regular contribution to meaning in other words? Yes, it means can be touched, as in other words, like, in fact, the word touchable. Okay, can we analyze it further? Can we split this up even more into more indivisible units? Can we split them? For un, no, we can't split it. Un is a morpheme. We're done there. But what about touchable? Can you split these into other morphemes? Yes, you could. You could split touchable into touch and then able, right? So touch, the verb means to make contact here and in other words, like touched. Able, as a suffix, means something that can be done here and in other words, like reachable. So we can now segment this into three morphemes in untouchable. Now a word, what is a word? A word is a thing that consists of one or more morphemes. A word might only have one morpheme in it, it might have many, can't have zero. A word that contains only one morpheme is called monomorphemic. Monomorphemic. Examples are things like cat, dog, catalog, go, these basic words. You can add morphemes to a word to create a new word sometimes. So for example, you can take the monomorphemic word cat and then add the morpheme plural s to get the word cats in English. When you do this, the root or the stem is the word to which the morpheme is added. And the affixes are the morphemes that are in fact added. So for example, in cats, the root or the stem is the morpheme cat and the morpheme s, which is attached to it, is an affix, in this case a suffix. When an affix goes after a root, 
It's called a suffix. A suffix is just an affix that goes after a root. When an affix goes before a root, it's called a prefix. So for example, in cats, we have the root cat followed by the suffix, plural s. And in the word unclear, we have the prefix, which is the morpheme un, and then the root, which is clear. We can also categorize morphemes into two kinds. There's what we call free morphemes and bound morphemes. A free morpheme is a morpheme which could appear alone in a monomorphemic word. For example, in cat-like, well, the root cat is a free morpheme because it could stand on its own as a word, the word cat. And the suffix like again, is a free morpheme, because the word like can stand on its own as a word in English. A bound morpheme, on the other hand, is a morpheme which cannot appear in a monomorphemic word. It has to be attached to something else. So for example, in the word cats, that consists of cat followed by s, a suffix. Cat, again, is a free morpheme, but s, the plural s, is a bound morpheme because it can't show up on its own as a word. You can't like ask someone how many cats are there and then the answer s, meaning plural, doesn't work, right? This is a bound morpheme. It can only show up as a suffix. It can't show up on its own. So for example, let's look at this word untouchable in English. Un, the first part, is a bound morpheme. It can't show up on its own. You can't just say un, you have to attach it to a word. A bull at the end is also a bound morpheme. And now you might think, well, A-B-L-E, that's a separate word, able, right? In English, able, that's a separate word. But be careful not to be misled by the spelling. This ending, this suffix is spelled A-B-L-E. But remember, in terms of the phonemes, it's a bull, it's not able. So the question is really, is a bull something you can say on its own as a word, a bull? And it's not. It's a bound morpheme in English. And of course, touch in the middle there is a free morpheme. It can show up on its own as a word. So we are going to do morphological analysis, similar to how we did phonemic analysis in phonology. The goal of morphological analysis is to identify and classify morphemes and describe how they combine together to form words in a language. Here's an example. I'm going to give you some data from ancient Greek. You don't have to know ancient Greek. This is just an example, example data set, and we're going to do morphemic analysis, morphological analysis. So here's the word I write in ancient Greek. It's grapho. Okay? Here's the word he or she writes in ancient Greek. It's grape. Grape. So just based on this data, it looks like there's three morphemes here. Can you identify what the three morphemes are? Hmm. So it looks like there's grap, which means right. There's all, meaning I. There's e, meaning he or she. These are three repeating sequences of phonemes that you see in the forms which make a regular contribution to meaning. If it has grap in it, then it means right. If it has o at the end, it means I. If it has e at the end, it means he or she. So the analysis is um, the form uh, grapho consists of the morpheme grap followed by the morpheme o, meaning I write, similarly for he or she writes. And we can ask, are these morphemes free or bound? And I would say, given this small data set of two forms, we don't really know if these are free or bound. So can grap show up on its own as a word? Turns out the answer is no, but based on this data, you don't really have enough data to conclude that yet, given the example here. Here's another example from Hungarian. So the word for house is hoz. Egyhoz means one house. Hozal means his or her house. Bor means wine. Egybor means one wine. Boro means his or her wine. Okay, so let's do the morphological analysis. Can we segment this into morphemes, segments of 
phonemes which make regular contributions to meaning. What are the morphemes present in something like adjots? We can try splitting it up in a few different ways. Okay, how about edge and then oz? Is this gonna work? So you go through the list, you see, is there a regular contribution to meaning which is made by the sequence of phonemes edge, uh, j, h? Do we see that? Well, not really, we only see that sequence of phonemes once, so that doesn't really have a regular meaning. How about oz? Well, all of the words for house do have oz in them, so maybe that's house, okay. But a much better segmentation would be this. So we see that edge shows up regularly in all the forms that have one in the meaning. And haws shows up regularly in all the forms that have house as part of the meaning. So we have now two sequences of phonemes making a regular contribution to meaning, two morphemes. Edge is in fact the morpheme that means one. Haws is in fact the morpheme that means house. So now, is this morpheme edge in this data free or bound? Think about it. Is edge free or bound? Look at the data. Do you see edge showing up on its own as a word? It's bound based on these data. In fact, in the Hungarian language, that's a free morpheme, but based on this data, it's a bound morpheme because you never see it on its own. How about the morpheme hos? Is that free or bound? Well, just looking at the data, we do see it on its own, so it's free. How about finding roots and affixes? What is the root of something like edge hos? It's hos. That's the word to which an affix is added. And edge, is that a prefix or a suffix? So is it coming before or after the root? It comes before, so it's a prefix. So that was a bit uh, example of morphological analysis. You're going to do, be doing much more interesting examples in your exercises and in your problem set. Now I'm going to talk about what happens when we combine morphemes. What are some of the restrictions on the ways morphemes are combined in different languages? Can you just combine any morpheme with any other morpheme and get a new word? Is it that simple? Like I notice I can take touch and I can add ing two different morphemes and I end up with touching. I could do that. But what about this? I can take happy and then add ing to it and I would get happying. I don't know, happying. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that would mean. So it turns out you can't just arbitrarily add another morpheme to another morpheme and get another word. There's restrictions on how you can combine morphemes to get words in a language. I notice also I can take a word like cat and add like to it and get cat-like. Can I take a word walk, like the verb walk, and then add like to it and get walk-like? No, it doesn't really make sense, right? Not the kind of thing that an English speaker would do. So in order to explain this, in order to describe these restrictions on what morphemes go with what other morphemes, we're going to have to introduce this concept of lexical categories. Lexical categories are categories that determine which affixes a word can take. So these are also called parts of speech. This is now where this is going to be familiar to you if you've taken a grammar class or an English class or whatever you've learned about things like nouns, verbs, prepositions. Those are lexical categories. So for example, the lexical category of verb in English is defined by the fact that it can take affixes like ing at the end, meaning an event in progress, or s at the end, meaning third person singular present, or ud at the end, meaning past tense, so that's like walk, walked. A noun in English is a word which can take affixes like like, like cat turns into cat-like or like s meaning plural, cat turns into cats, or s meaning possessive, like if I say the cat's toy, I've added the s to the end of cat to make it be possessive. An adjective is a thing which can take affixes like ness at the end, which turns it into a noun, and it means the property of, so like happy plus ness gives you happiness. It can also take things like est at the end, so happy plus us gives you happiest. 
and so on. So this is a template of all the affixes that a verb can take in English. The lexical category of verb in English is defined by the fact that it can take these affixes. We have like third person, singular present s, past tense ud. You notice that each affix has associated with it a certain function in terms of how it changes the meaning. English nouns take s for plural. Adjectives take things like er and ust to indicate comparatives, superlatives, and so on. Here's some examples. Now there are further lexical categories, categories of words defined in terms of what affixes they take. There's things like adverbs, things like happily and quickly, like I sang happily or I ran quickly. These do not take suffixes. But the morpheme li, a suffix that you can put at the end of an adjective, turns it into an adverb. So you can take quick, which is an adjective, add li at the end, and you get quickly, and now it's an adverb. There's also some lexical categories that don't take any affixes in English. These are words that you can't add stuff to before or after. These are things like prepositions, of, for, to. Things like determiners, the, this, that, a, your, my. You can't say something is like my like, right? It doesn't make sense. You, have, you can say my car and that's a determiner. Pronouns, things like he, she, it, they, them. In English, these things do not take affixes, although in other languages they do. Conjunctions and or but, these are words that you can't add stuff to. So overall, we can distinguish two broad kinds of lexical category. There's what we call open categories. These are categories that allow new words to be formed by adding affixes. So it's easy to come up with new nouns, new verbs, new adjectives, new adverbs, things you've never heard before, but you immediately understand them. Um, the, uh, these are also called content words because these are words which convey a lot of contentful meaning. The other category of word is what we call closed categories. Closed categories are words that very rarely allow new words in the category. These are things like prepositions, determiners, pronouns, conjunctions. So think about like the new words that you're currently learning, say in this class. You've learned new words like phoneme and morpheme. Those are nouns. That's because noun is an open category. It readily accepts new members into the category. It's easy to come up with new nouns, Either, often by adding affixes, so that using morphology. Whereas it's unlikely at this point that you, as a competent English speaker, are going to learn a new preposition, right? You know them, it's of, for, to, whatever. You're not gonna learn a new preposition that you've never heard before, right? It's unlikely. So those are what we call closed categories. And it's best to keep in mind that this open category, closed category thing is more like a spectrum. Content word and function word. So the Closed categories are also called function words. So for example, in pronouns, it's very rare that a new pronoun comes into existence in a language. It's usually a closed category, but it does happen. 